this theater that I saw many of the films that went on to influence me as a filmmaker. It was here I saw Duel in the Sun. I saw A Man and a Woman, Claude Lelouch's great film, which had a big influence on me as a filmmaker. The Magnificent Seven I saw here, and On the Waterfront I saw in this, in this very theater. And of course, as I say, a homecoming, um, a few miles down the road here is the Haverford School where NFL films began. And this is a story that could never happen again. It's so unique, I never get tired of telling it. People never get tired of asking me to tell it. It's the kind of a story that uh, you would read in Saturday Evening Post or Family Circle magazine. Uh, NFL films, we've all heard these wonderful words. It's important to remember that NFL films began with a wedding present. My dad, uh, who was an overcoat salesman, as a wedding present, got a 16 millimeter Bell and Howell movie camera. And everything that I did as his only son, he captured with that camera. My first haircut, my first pony ride, my first football game at Haverford School, my first birthday. There was my dad with that wind-up camera. In fact, I don't ever remember my dad ever having a head. It was just turning around and seeing my dad with his camera. But when I graduated Haverford School and went to Colorado College, my dad decided at this point, he was 48, that he wanted to make his hobby his profession. And I know many people come to me in NFL films and they think, what am I going to do with my life? And I always say, my dad was 48 years old before he decided what he wanted to do. And that was make football movies. And I went away to Colorado College and my dad decided to raise his sights and do the one thing he knew best and that was to make football movies. And he found out in 1961, and this is hard to believe, that the film rights for the NFL championship game had been sold to the highest bidder for $1,500. And those of you here, and there are many here that know my dad, know that my dad's theory of life is if you like something, you get two of them. You like a Mercedes Benz, you buy two. You have horses, you buy two. A doctor tells you to take two, you take four. <laughs> That's always been my dad's theory. So when it came to this bidding, he doubled the bid. He bid $3,000, and he won the bid. And Pete Rozelle opened up the bidding and was flattered that someone would bid that much money for the NFL championship game. But he was a little concerned that when he read my dad's resume, it said, experience, and my dad wrote, filming my 14-year-old son. <laughs> so this is where my dad's experience as a salesman came in, and as he says that uh, after three martinis at the St. Laurent, he convinced Pete Rozelle that he could do the film. And that night, I remember coming back from, we had played Idaho State, and I remember coming back and getting a phone call from my dad, and he said, um, you know, You've been in school for a while. I can see by your grades that all you've been doing is playing football and going to the movies. And that makes you uniquely qualified for this job. <laughs> so I came back from school, and in 1962, with five cameramen, we filmed the 62 championship game. And my memories of that, I think, are, real, are still so clear in my mind. Number one, there's never been an NFL championship game that's had that many Hall of Famers on the field. There were 17 Hall of Famers on the field for that game. It was bitterly cold, and I remember my dad was so nervous. He had the runs. He was in the bathroom the whole time. He never saw any of the game. He was so nervous that we, did, we finished the game, and we went in the locker room. And I remember walking into that locker room, and the first person I saw was Ray Nitschke, and his face was just a mask of, of blood, dry blood. Right next to him, Jimmy Taylor, my idol. I had his number 31 in, in, foot in, the, in Colorado College. He was getting stitches in his lip where he'd been hit by Sam Huff. And right next to him, on the bench, seated, seated right next to him, was Bart Starr, who was just taking off his pants, and there were just ribbons of these horrible-looking black and blue welts on his ribs. And I remember thinking that, boy, this is not the game that I had experienced in college. But little did I know then that I would be part of this game for the rest of my life and I would help make it grow. And then we had our first premiere of this film, and this is always, I think, a good, a good anecdote. Dad decided to have it 
it took Shores, which was a real elite uh, bar in New York, where Mickey Mantle hang out, Joe DiMaggio and Jack Dempsey, and Dad says, well, that's where we're going to have it, and we're going to set up the projector. We went up that night, and we brought in the projector, and we set up the screen, so there was nothing like this, and we put the, the screen up here, we set the projector and threaded the film, and we had, I remember Red Smith was there, Dick Young, uh, Ray, you would remember Hugh Brown of the Bulletin was there, and we started the, the, the film, and about 10 minutes into it, all of a sudden, the picture started to slide off the screen and disappeared, and there was this tremendous crash. And we looked around, and a waiter who had been going by with the crab remick and the shrimp sauce had knocked out the cord, and there was our first film laying in a pile of, 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 of uh, cocktail sauce on the floor. And to Pete Rosell's credit, he recognized that he had a disaster on his hands, and he held a press conference, and he got a Frank Gifford, Del Schaffner, and Alex Webster answer questions. And my dad and I are picking up everything, re you know, recycling the projector, rethreading it. And a few of the writers stayed around. They saw the end of it, and the few that saw it gave us some good reviews. But the thing that happened that really changed, as as far as we were concerned as filmmakers, was that my dad had the entrepreneurial vision to see that that there was something about this game of pro football that had a great future to it. The next year, he bid, he doubled the bid, I think he bid 7,000, and we got the rights. The next year, he bid 10,000, and we got the rights for the 64 championship. But then, I remember my dad coming home one night at dinner with mom and my sister Blair, and he said, I think it's over. I don't think we're ever going to be able to, to keep bidding because he said sooner or later, a 20th Century Fox or a, a Universal, a big motion picture company is going to realize there's something to this National Football League and I'll never be able to compete against it. But he had an idea. He decided to go to the owners, and there were only 12 owners at the time, and he pitched the idea that why don't you buy our family company? It was called Blair Motion Pictures, named after my sister. There were four of us. And he said, you can own your own film company and we'll do all your highlight films. And the owners, there were 12 of them at the time, said, you know, this guy, Sable, with his loud sport jacket, you know, he might have a good idea. And each owner, of course, with the support of Pete Rosell, put up $20,000 and they bought our, our family company, Blair Motion Pictures, and we became NFL Films. And I remember my dad coming home that night saying this, is, this was the breakthrough that we needed. Because number one, we had the support of the NFL. Number two, we had money to buy equipment and hire cameramen. And number three, and to any artist in the, in the, in the audience will know, we suddenly had the confidence to, to go ahead and try a lot of ideas that we hadn't before. And once you get that confidence as an artist, boy, that's like four-wheel drive. Then you can just shift it in, and you can, take, you can go into territory where you've never been before. And the other thing that we had, and this again goes back to Pete Rosell, is that we had freedom as filmmakers. And there's two types of freedom. There's freedom to, and there's freedom from. And we, had from. we had freedom to come up with the ideas, and just as importantly, freedom from somebody else to say, well, that's a good idea, but let's change this and change that. Pete Rosell had great confidence in us, and to the extent that he just said, look, stay in Philadelphia. You don't have to move to New York. Stay in Philadelphia, and you'll be fine there. We don't need you involved in the, in the, in the corporate end of the National Football League. And then in 1967, I came up with an idea called, they call it pro football. And it was using a lot of the things that, that I had learned in art school. I was an art major in college and had the opportunity, and again, the freedom from the NFL to tr put these into this one film. And this one film, actually, um, 10 years later, Sports Illustrated, in a history of television, they had an article, they called this film uh, The Citizen Kane of Sports Movies, because everything that we see today really can be traced back to this one film they call a pro football. We had ground level slow motion. We had players and coaches, Mike for sound. We had a quarterback that stayed on the, uh, we had a camera that stayed on the quarterback. We had montage editing, which seems common now, but it had never been done before, meaning that we didn't have to show the complete play. We just show the, the ball carrier, Gale Sayers, get the ball. The best part of the run before he crossed the goal line, we cut and we went to something else. And of course, we had our own music, and then as the final finishing touch, we hired a newscaster 
that was here in Philadelphia who was just about to be put out to pasture by the name of John Facenda. And with his voice and the music and everything that all came together, I still to this day remember sitting in that, in that uh, recording booth and writing the first words that John Facenda ever wrote, ever read for us, and it was, it starts with a whistle and ends with a gun. And I remember him reading that as simple as it was, and looking at my dad in the back, and where our eyes met, and we knew, damn, we're, we're on to something that's really different. And when we premiered that film, it was the Walter Reed Theater in New York, Pete Rozelle came up, and he said, you know, that was more than a highlight film. He says, that was a real movie. And I always remember that as the ultimate compliment. And then the next day, Dad got a call from Pete Rosell, and he said, Ed, I want you and Steve to come up to my offices in 410 Park Avenue. I want to talk to him. We didn't know what that could possibly be. We drove up, and I'll remember that Pete had an old wooden desk, and that's when the NFL had just four or five offices. And he pulled out a piece of paper, and he says, this is something called a Nielsen ratings. And we didn't know what that was. He says, but I want you to look at this. Number one, that's baseball. Number two in the Nielsen Rings is college football, and here we are, the National Football League, we're third. And if we expect us to prosper as a league and to grow, we have got to succeed on television. And in order to succeed on television, we have to create an image, a mystique for this sport. And the film that you just did will help us create that mystique. And that was the closest thing to a mission statement that we ever got from Pete. I, people have talked about us being marketers. We never had focus groups or surveys or nobody even knew about demographics. We always believed that you go, that you make decisions with your head, with your heart, rather than your head. And that was always, always our motto. And that's how we, that's how we grew as a company from that, from that one film. And I always looked at, at us as storytellers. And Merrill said it, and Glenn talked about it, and, and Mike. That's the core of what we do. And I thought for tonight's presentation, when <clears throat> Julie asked me to show some of our films, I thought that would be the theme, is that we are storytellers. And I remember as a kid, one of my favorite stories was the Just So Stories by Rudyard Kipling. And in the beginning, in the, in the very prologue of the book, it said, tell me a fact, and I'll learn. Tell me the truth, and I'll believe. But tell me a story, and it will live in my heart forever. And that's been a motto that we've used at NFL Films ever since we started. And what I wanted to do tonight was to, was to take six different examples of storytelling about football. And each story will show, will show is totally different. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's interesting how many different ways we can present football. But at the core, it's storytelling. And that's the theme of tonight. And each, uh, for each of the excerpts, each one, by the way, is an Emmy Award winner. I wanted the producer, I, Keith Cosro and Kenny Rogers and Ray Dittinger, to come up and explain the creative process behind it and show each expert, ex excerpt. Each excerpt runs about from seven to eight minutes. And I'm going to take the first one because I wanted to talk about, spend a few minutes talking about photography because that's the way I started. And the first excerpt that I wanted to show is really the story of the season, just told through photography and sound, no script. And when I was, a, I was an art major in college, and one of the artists that really fascinated me was Picasso. And I would study him, and when I became a cameraman, I tried to apply the things that Picasso did in art to photography. And he would take a woman's face, a bowl of fruit, and look at it from multiple perspectives and from different moments in time. And I thought, why can't I do that with a football play? Why can't we put a super slow motion camera on the ground? We'll put someone up top. We'll put someone in the end zone. We'll put someone in the reverse side. He'll shoot 24 frames. He'll shoot 120. He'll shoot 30 frames a second. And then we'll take this raw vision and try to edit it into a coherent story. And the other artist that it, it affected me as a, as a cameraman was Paul Cezanne, the famous French Impressionistic painter. And he said that all art is selected detail. That was something that I remembered. And I felt to tell stories in the National Football League, we needed details. It's not just the football action. We needed the passage of time, the way the sun comes through the stadium, the clean marks in the mud, a, a gnarled, bloody hands, the, uh, the uh, silhouette of Tom Landry 
silhouette of just the hat against the stands. Those were all parts of telling the story. As a cameraman, I was one of those cameramen that told those stories. I shot 15 Super Bowls I never saw a play, but I could tell you what Tom Landry wore. I could tell you Bart Starr spraying his thumb in the second, uh, second Super Bowl, what the Vince Lombardi was wearing in the first Super Bowl. But all of these ideas that came from studying art, because when I went to college, there was no film school, I tried to put into shooting art in the covering games. And we developed a style that we still have to this day. We have, people think we have 10 cameras at every game. We don't, we have two or three, that's it. But that's all they do is shoot football. We have one cameraman that's rooted right above the action, we call him a tree. He's at the 50 yard, he shoots your basic game action. Another cameraman is on the ground, and he's called a mole. All he shoots is ground level, he's got a telephoto lens, it can go from 12 to 200 frames, he can shoot various speeds. And the third cameraman we use is what I was, is a weasel. And he shoots everything but the action. He shoots all the details. And when you put these three elements together, you have the NFL film style. And that's what I wanted to show first. This is a piece we call the season in six minutes. And it's the whole past season, but just in pictures and sound, no script. And I think it'll give you an understanding of what I'm talking about when it comes to telling stories. And this is the first of the six episodes, six excerpts we wanted to show. So Dave, why don't you roll this one? 